creating your MVP, and I didn't. I was really unsatisfied with that title, but I couldn't think of anything better. Um, tonight, like about five minutes ago, I realized startup validation hat sort of been a cool thing to call it. So I might change it to that. But um, kind of the same idea. Like, what can you do to validate your idea before you go off and build it? So, without further ado. Um, did anyone, was anyone here at the Lean Startup Conference this year, back in November? So Eric Reese was a big Lean Startup Conference. And Justin Wilcox got up on the stage before the thousands of people, thousands of entrepreneurs there, and he said, your startup isn't a business. It's a hobby. I can understand why you might get the two of them confused, because there's a lot of similarities going on there, right? First off, they're both way more fun than having a real job. They're both really easy to assess over, and they both cost a shit ton of money, especially when you consider the opportunity cost of getting a real job. But here's the center. With a business, you actually make more money than you give up. So the question that you should be asking yourself as you're starting your startup, you're thinking about a startup to start, is, is your startup going to be a business, or is it going to be a hobby? So, um, one thing that I do like about this notion of minimum viable products, even if that term is really overused, um, is this goal of what we're trying to accomplish here. And so the way I kind of think about it is kind of a Venn diagram, is the goal of doing a minimum viable product is to figure out where your vision of how you're going to change the world intersects with what reality can actually accommodate. And a really good example of this is a startup you might have heard of called The Point. And their kind of idea or big vision was to harness the collective power of all the people on the internet to affect change. So whether you're raising money, organizing people, or trying to influence change, if you can't do it alone, you can do it on the point. This is a pretty cool vision, right? I mean, this is pretty empowering that we're going to use all the people on the internet to make all this change. But it was kind of totally unfocused. So it could be used for anything from political activism to boycotting multinational corporations to I don't know, like getting a bunch of people together for a group discount at Pizzeria, right? And so it wasn't gaining traction. They had to actually lay off one of the co-founders, and it was about to go under. But the CEO kind of stepped back and said, is there anything about my vision that is working? And actually, that getting people together for a group discount at Pizzeria, that was working. And if that sounds familiar, it could because that CEO was Andrew Mason. And he turned it into Groupon, which became the fastest growing company ever. So um, I know they're having some issues now, but I really love this example and what Andrew Mason says is he's talking about this change as they go from the point to group on. So I just have a one minute clip. If you guys want to listen. The biggest mistake we made with the point was was being kind of completely uh, encumbered by this vision of what I wanted it to be and taking 10 months to, to build the product and making all these assumptions about people want, what people would want that we then spent the next 10 months backtracking on instead of focusing on the one little piece of the product that people actually liked. So um, if there was any advice I'd have, it's you're, you're, you're way too dumb to figure out um, whether your idea is good. It's up, to, it's up to the masses. So build that very small thing and um, and get it out there and keep on trying different things and eventually you'll get it right. And then, so, um, if there is nothing else that you guys take away from tonight, I want it to be this. I want it to be that you are way too dumb to figure out whether your idea is good or not. So don't be like Andrew Mason was. Don't get so encumbered by your initial vision that you go off and you spend 10 months trying to build something, right? Yes. Yeah, so the idea was, so the point could be used to, like, have a bunch of people get together to have some kind of action. So it turned out that getting a bunch of people together to say, we want a discount at pizza, that was working. So, yeah, it was kind of very different from what his initial idea was of how it would be used. But it turned out that one little bit works, right? Um, so, so, yeah, don't, don't get so encumbered. Just kind of... Build that one little thing, get it out there to the masses, and keep trying different things, and eventually you'll get it right. So this is the whole vision of a minimum viable product, and like I kind of started to allude to earlier, I'm sort of starting to dislike this term because I feel like it's getting used for way too many things and becoming a buzzword. Um, so I'm just curious, like, what are some of the ways that you guys have heard MVP used? Like, have you heard it defined? Yeah. 
minimum marketable cost. So what does that mean? Oh, that's very specific. Okay. Six to 20 customers will buy. I haven't heard that one before. Thank you. Um, who else has heard a definition for MVP? Yeah. Yeah. I like that. So, proof of concept that you can get something out that customers are going to respond to. Yeah. Okay, I like that. Valuable, useful, and feasible. So, nice good definitions here. So, this is better than some of the things I've heard. Yeah. I guess it's basically what they the mineral prize you build to be test whether or not it's I like that. So the minimum product you can build that'll test whether the pain point you're trying to solve is exists or if your solution would solve that. Okay, it exists or whether so you might be two different MVPs. One does it exist, one does it solve it. Yeah. I like that. Simplest version that would be valuable to the customers. These are all really good. Yeah. You obviously know these, but it's so yes, it's a very iterative process of kind of getting something out there and learning from it and trying again and again, which is kind of what Andrew Mason was alluding to too. So these are all awesome. These I, definitions are what I like about minimum viable products. I don't like when people are like, oh, MVP, that just means to go build a happy product, right? <laughs> so I don't like that uh, connotation, um, but the other stuff I do like. Um, and kind of how I started thinking of it. Um, is not even so much as necessarily a product like a software product or a hardware product, but just what's the smallest thing that I can do that's going to help me kind of figure out if I'm building a business or just a hobby here. So um, the thing about the process, which you alluded to, um, is it's very iterative, right? So I'm like an agile person, and so I like to use words like agile or iterative and incremental, but some people might just call it messy. Um, but the truth is that there's really not like a clear step one, step two, step three that I can walk you through here. Um, but so kind of in the spirit of how startups work and very kind of chaotic is I thought I would throw a bunch of stuff at you, a bunch of things that startups are doing um, to kind of show you what's working, what isn't, and uh, so you can better start to make your own calls about what your good MVP would be. Cool? Okay. So, um... A cool thing about what I've been doing the last few years is I've gotten to work with hundreds of early stage startups, which is really awesome, um, and I love it. Um, and the number one problem that I see these early stage startups make, startups make is that they fail to do this step number one. They fail to find a problem that's worth solving. And so what that often looks like is something like this, that people get all excited and we have this awesome idea for a product, we went off and we built it and put it up on our website, and not a single person puts into it. So what did, what did we learn from that? Didn't test it. Didn't test your assumptions. What's that? Didn't think at all. <laughs> well, that's possible, but it might be actually an awesome product and you just don't know how to market it, right? Or it might be that you marketed it to the totally wrong people. Or it might just be a horrible product, right? Actually, it's kind of really inconclusive. All that you really learned, I think, is that something isn't working, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's that people buy your product or use your product because it's not because they also have like cool technology because you serve their job back in their daily life. So that is really helping them to do something. So you really need to think about the needs of your client. Yeah. It's just some sort of technology. Definitely, definitely. So, yeah, you have it spot on. Um, I'll repeat things because the are being video, but it doesn't really matter how cool your technology is. Are you, like, actually solving a problem for someone or not? And at that point, it doesn't even matter what the technology is, right? Um, so, so we didn't really learn anything useful from this experiment, which unfortunately happens way too much. Um, and so then the question is, is there a faster way to kind of learn that that wasn't going to work? So we could have just put the website up with a link, and when someone clicked through to it, said, oops, it's not available, right? And if we had some analytics behind it, which was the kind of zero people that clicked through, we would have learned just as much without having to build anything. And so a perfectly viable tactic that I'm guessing
thing you guys know, you guys can be pretty cool at MVP, um, is landing page. So just let's put a page up there that says what we're doing and see if anyone's even interested in it before we buy it. So um, you guys are probably familiar with that. Um, but I'll give you a concrete example of that I like with Buffer. So does anybody know Buffer? Pretty cool. If anybody like, likes to tweet a whole lot or just post to social media in general, um, it queues up your social media posts and tweets and stuff and will kind of schedule them out for you so you don't spam your followers like when you find a bunch of cool stuff. Even it out for you. So this is how they look today, and I love the product. Um, but this is not how they started. So they started. The founder Joel had this idea, and he said, "I'm not sure if anyone would be interested in this beyond myself. So let me just put up this simple landing page and tweet it out." So all this landing page did is, like, the first version of the product was just going to be focused on Twitter. Tweet the time to tweet, add tweet to tweet to your buffer, and we're going to do the rest. We'll tweet it out for you. He just put this page up, which took him like a minute to do, and tweeted it out. If people click the fans and pricing button on there, that's not very well. Um, then you got kind of an each page, right? You caught us before we're ready, but if you're interested, give us your email address, and we'll let you know when you're ready. So he tweeted it out. People came to the page, and then entered their email address. And he said, you know what? That's good enough. I don't need like a billion. Have you ever guys ever heard of vanity metrics? Then any metrics are like, oh, I got one million people giving me their email address. That's really nice. But are you making revenue off of one million email addresses unless you're selling them or something, right? So a lot of times we're just kind of looking for a signal. Is there like a good signal that people are interested or not? So he tweeted it. People came to the page. Some people left their email addresses. It wasn't a billion people, but he felt like there's interest here. So he decided, okay, um, I'm going to do the next, my next MVP now. Um, can anybody, does anyone want to take a guess at what he did next? Have them log in with our Twitter account? Oh, that would be good. Um, that's not what he did next, but that would be good because it would show that they're willing to, to use it. Yeah. Put actual pricing. Exactly. So it's really nice that people are interested, but before it's a business, you have to see if people are actually willing to pay you money. So all he did was add one page to the screen that said, Hey, here's your pricing plan. We even had a free plan, but he had paid plans too. So he's going to see if people interested in this enough that they would pay. <laughs> kept feeding it out. People kept coming to the page. They kept clicking through. Most of them did click free, but some of them took the paid plan. And he thought, you know what? That's enough to do like an initial slice of this product. Now, this is Buffer was like a really simple app. So he thought it was going to take him like a day to do the initial version. But software is hard. <laughs> it never goes right, right? So it took him a week. But still, it wasn't like, you know, if he was going to go do something for 10 months, he probably needed more validation. But if he's going to spend a day, even a week, this is enough validation. There's like just some signal here that someone other than my friends and my mom are interested in this. Um, so he spent a week, he put the initial version of this, and within 30 days he had, I forget the number, maybe like 500 users. He had like a good number of users. So he was already bringing in some revenue as he built it. Not a ton, but he's getting some. And more importantly, he's got real users using it. So he can get their feedback and see how they're using it. And so he's evolving it based on how real people are using it. So I really like that example. Um, so landing pages are really good tools. Has anyone here ever used any landing page tools like Lunchbox or Unbounce? So these are really simple tools. You don't need any coding at all to just put up a simple landing page. I used to really like Lunchbox. And then, I don't know why, but they changed it. And it used to be like in five minutes, you could have a landing page up. And it's like, right? And it's like, now it's like 500 steps and buggy and not working very well. So I'm still trying to find another substitute. Um, but if you guys want to do a landing page test, Google landing pages because there's constantly new products coming out. Um, Kickoff Labs is pretty decent. And you can do a free, a free one pretty simply. So it's just like a couple of minutes. You just kind of give it, here's the title that I want on my page, there's a little blurb, there's like a picture or a video, and then it collects your information. Um, if you want to do something more fancy that you're willing to pay for, Unbounce is fantastic. They let you do multiple pages, they let you do split testing to try different messages. Um, the key thing that you're looking for here is just something that's going to be able to get this landing page up really quickly, you don't want to spend that much time on it, and then capture analytics for you. So um, the main thing, this is actually a launch rock report, but the main things that you're interested in page views, like how many people are you able to get to come to the page. Um, sign up, so then of the people that you got to come, how many people are actually interested enough that they're signing up, so like it gives you a conversion rate there, um, four out of ten people 
signed up. It's like a totally just way that page that I did. So your conversion rate forty percent. Um, and then this last thing here, I don't know if you can read it, but it says shares. So this gets really important is um, how many people not only signed up, but were so excited about what you're doing that they actually shared it out with others. And that's going to help you understand, like, and I'll get into this a little bit more later, but you really want people who are really excited that you're going to solve this problem for them. And so the number of shares can really be a good indicator of that. Um, so these landing pages will capture these analytics for you. They'll also give you the email addresses. So that's kind of like a no-brainer. It's really easy to do. Um, and if you want to do something a little more complex, Unbounce has a blog with a lot of best practices on landing pages. So, okay. Landing pages are really nice to validate that people are interested and maybe even willing to pay you money. But what's even better than that is people actually paying you money before you build a product, right? So Kickstarter is awesome for this. Um, do you guys know Pebble? Are familiar with Pebble? There's all these smart watches coming out now. This is like, I guess it was one of the first ones, but it's like a keypad for lot. It talks to your smartphone, and then you can have apps on it. You can like in your cycling, you can have a cycling computer, you can like control Spotify with it or get text messages on it. It's pretty cool. Um, so, especially with something if you're doing like a hardware product, that's a lot of money, right, to go create a product. And so you don't want to just go put down a bunch of money to go create the product. It was really nice to know people are actually going to pay you for it. So, Pebble and a lot of places will use Kickstarter as sort of like a pre-order system, saying, okay, let me see if anyone's actually willing to pre-order my watch, and I'll set a goal. So they set a goal of $100,000. If we can't collect $100,000, we don't have enough money to make it, or maybe it's just not worth our while, you know, whatever that number meant to them. If we set the goal, then the people give us the money, and we give them watches. Um, what was cool about Pebble is they not only kept $100,000, but they were the largest Kickstarter ever, and they hit over $10 million. And I liked that, like, the number was so big, it doesn't even quite fit in the... <laughs> so, um, so they did quite nicely. Um, another interesting thing that's being done with Kickstarter is using it to kind of crowd test what a good price point is. Sometimes it's really hard. You're like, okay, I want to build this product, but I'm not sure how much people are willing to pay for it, and that's going to make it hard for me to figure out if I can make enough money from it to actually have a viable business or not, right? So the guy Justin Wilcox that I was talking about in the beginning, he's doing this bounce that. Um, and he actually used something called Self Starter. It's an open source version of Kickstarter. So you can kind of like roll your own Kickstarter. And you can do things like split testing in it. So he put it up there. He put one version for $5, another version for $10, and he started capturing analytics on them. And so what was interesting was at $5, 1.4% of the people purchased. At $10, 1.7% of the people purchased. So that's kind of a lot for it. I'm not kind of surprised. He's now got it up there for $20, but like it's been sitting at $20 like, since November. <laughs> that number isn't really moving. So I don't think people are paying $20 for it. But it's interesting. So you can use this to not only get pre orders, but also see what a good price point is. So Kickstarter and sort of the alternative to putting a brand at a good price. Yeah, this is why this is why I don't like that the minimum viable product because I feel like doing the Kickstarter kind of falls within what an MVP is, but you're not creating products. So the Kickstarter itself is the MVP, but it's a weird term, right? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean there there might be minimum virtual product. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I know for hardware in general, you can do things like prototypes or just get like a one-off, like um, bounce imaging here. Do you guys know bounce imaging? They're one of the IRI residents. And they've got their like four um, emergency responders who are like want to go into a room that might not be safe at all. So the ball into my store in and it like tests the air to see if it's safe and it takes pictures. Like it has cameras all around it. So it'll take a 360 view of the room, see if it's safe to go in there. Um, so they just like use the 3D printer, right? To create the ball and some of the parts in it. I'm sure all the parts are not created with 3D printer, but. <laughs> and they're able to use that, like with law enforcement, to like try things out. So there's definitely MVP you can do with hardware. But yeah, that term is like really broad in what it means. <laughs> Does that help? <laughs> um, so then. 
I feel like I would be remiss talking about MVPs without talking about kind of the most famous, probably MVP, which is Dropbox. So you guys have heard about the Dropbox video. So they put out the three minute video on Hacker News and overnight. So this is within a landing page. It's a little more hidden, but um, so you can see there's like a sign up for an email address. Um, they put this up on Hacker News and overnight they went from 5,000 sign ups to 75,000 sign ups. So that, that was pretty amazing, right? So, another really good tool is MV video. Um, you know, those are kind of the, I feel like those are like the low hanging fruit, the obvious MVP tools that we hear about a lot. Um, but I think we kind of need to step back from that and say, you know, it's really easy. Like, there's so many great tools out there, like Unbouncer, um, Kickstarter, that make it really easy to build these, um, you know, random pages or Kickstarters. But um, how do you get? How do you get 75,000 signups overnight, right? How do you, if you're Pebble and you raise $10 million, a Kickstarter project just for context usually goes about 30 days. So they raise $10 million in 30 days from 69,000 backers. Um, I have no idea, but assuming they 10% of the people who came pledged money, which I doubt it was even that high, that means they had at least 690,000 people coming to the right page, right? So how do you get that many people to your page? I think it's a more interesting question. Um, and a harder question, because it really means that you have to really know your customer extremely well. Um, so to give you some examples, you guys all know Airbnb. I feel like that's an obvious, I like presented something at to high school kids a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and they really liked the idea of sleeping in a historic beer barrel, but they didn't know what the Airbnb was. <laughs> so, um, one of the founders of Airbnb does not even own a home. He doesn't rent a home. He just like, goes around and sleeps in his store there, although, like, you know, stays at Airbnb properties. Like, that's really knowing your customer, right? Like, really understanding who they are and, like, what they're doing for and how they experience those. Um, Pinterest. I like this example, too. So, um, you know, we think of Pinterest as, like, this overnight success or something, but that really isn't true. So, when they came out, they got... I think within about six months, they had like 3,000 users, which if you're doing something that's like a social network where you're relying on network effects, 3,000 users is not very good after six months. Um, but worse than that, what it turned out was like their users were totally not active. They would come on once, maybe they'd create a board and like pin one thing, and that was it. They would come back. So it's not very useful, even though they had those 3,000 users. They had three really inactive users. And what it turned out was, you know, the team that built Pinterest was really well connected. I think Ben Silverman had been in my combinator before. And anyway, they like had a really good network of techies and developers, and so they told all their friends, and their friends told their friends. We just to reach 3,000 people and convince them to sign up. None of them were the target users, right? None of them were like housewives in the Midwest or whatever like, the target user is for Pinterest. Um, and so it didn't really matter that they had 3,000. So they're like, how are we going to reach these people who want to use it? And they didn't know. They did not know where these people hang out. So what they decided to do was create these meetup groups. They called them Pin It Forward. And the idea is they had a meetup, and people could come, and I don't know, they did, like, vision boards or something. I don't think I mean, like, the target audience here, but, like, a poster board with, like, pictures of things that made them happy or something, right? And people came, and they said, not even like a ton of people came, but people came who were so excited about it, right? And they told their friends, and they told their friends. Um, and so I think like an important takeaway, especially when you're in the really early stages of working on your startup, is it's way better to have 10 people who love your product than 100 people who are like, nah, or even 3,000, right? Because they are going to love it, they're going to use it, they're going to get excited about it, they're going to show off to other people what they did and get their friends on it. Another really interesting thing, so this is Ben Silverman, the, the CEO of Pinterest. Another interesting thing is he personally reached out to the first 5,000 users. Like he gave them his cell phone number and like met them for a copy. And, right? I mean, that's crazy. Can you even imagine the amount of work in that? So we look at Pinterest and we say, wow, they were like this overnight success. But they weren't. Like, he really did a lot of work on, like, really talking to people and understanding his customer and finding his customer. Um, so, okay, if you start to talk to, like, a ton of startups, then you start seeing kind of the same themes emerging again and again. So, for a while, I felt like every, like, I don't know, kind of startup I spoke to was doing a recipe app, right? 
And <laughs> you see these startups, and they're all doing the same thing, and none of them are really great in the top And you just kind of ask yourself, what problem are they solving? So, um, sorry, thank you. So, you know, um, it's funny because we think of Dropbox as being so wildly successful, but Drew Hoffman actually ran into this problem. So, he was trying to raise money for Dropbox and he was going to be and they're like, I don't know why you're even bothering in this space because there's already like a million billion cloud storage set up there, right? And Drew goes, yeah, but do you use any of them? So, Drew's thing is kind of know where your target audience comes out and speak to them in an authentic way. So he did a really good job of that. And by really understanding his audience, he was able to come up with a solution that makes so much sense. So there's like a really funny Quora question and answer. Has anyone ever seen it? I can pull it up and I'll put it in a slide. About why Dropbox is so elegant and like the right answer. Because you guys, I'm guessing like everyone uses Dropbox or has used Dropbox. Really simple. So all these other solutions out there, we're like trying to do all these different things, and just like you know what, it just needs to be simple and just work, and it doesn't need all these bells and whistles, right? You need that for his audience for him. So you're um, when you're at an early stage of a startup and you've got your idea and this fantastic thing that you want to build. Um, I think it's worthwhile to kind of step back and say, okay, how is this vision going to kind of intersect with what reality can accommodate? And I really like uh, business model canvas as a way to do that. Are people familiar with that? It's a good thing to look at. I'm not going to go into detail on it too much. Um, but basically, a lot of times when we're thinking about, you know, this is this idea that I have, a lot of times we're just thinking about the solution, right? But there's a whole lot more that goes into a business. And the idea of the business model canvas is not, let's not take, like, six months to get it on a 20 page business plan, let's just do it on one page, kind of scrappy, a couple hours, figure this out. And really, really think about what is the problem that I'm solving here? And, this is awkward, and who am I solving it for? And how am I going to reach those people, right? Like, Ben Silverman had to figure out how he was going to reach those people who are interested in Pinterest. And what makes me different from not only the competitors, but whatever people are doing today, instead of using my product. Um, and of course, the solution as well, but you know, then also, you know, what are some ways I'm going to make money and how are, what are my costs going to be? Just kind of get it on one page and just, does this even make sense? Is it possible to turn this idea into a business? And you kind of put a stick in the ground and start from there, and then you can start testing some things by doing these MVPs to validate if your assumptions are right. So that's a really fast intro to that. Um, I also find this is a little bit overwhelming if you're just like, oh, I have an idea. I'm not sure what all these skills are. Um, so I like to actually kind of even step back a little from that and start with just who's my customer and what problem am I solving for them. So if we take the recipe app, so I'm not having actually taken anyone doing recipe app in a while, so I guess that trend is over. Um, but for a while, when everyone's doing recipe apps, I'd say, okay, awesome, exciting that you're doing startup. Who's your customer? And they say, well, anyone who sucks. And they're like, anyone who sucks? Yeah. Because I want to be able to have the largest number of users possible, right? And that feels intuitive. We want to go after the customer base that's like the most number of people possible, right? But then I say, okay, well, what problem are you solving for them? And they say, helping them find recipes. So I don't know, who in here cooks? Okay. Who in here can't find recipes? There's this thing called Google, right? <laughs> so the problem when you're trying to like go after so many people is I feel like it's kind of like when you're trying to be the person that everybody likes and you're just not very interesting, right? So don't, don't do that. Um, instead, oops, sorry. Instead, try to like drill down a little bit. It's not that you can't go broader later once you like really nail your product down, but especially initially, you want to be really clear here. Who am I going after, or what am I going after? So I think there's a couple of approaches you can do to this. Um, one is you can kind of really focus on the customer side, and you can say, who are my people? Who am I like, really passionate and excited about helping? So, um, you know, this recipe example, I'm not like a real recipe person, but if I was building a recipe app, then there's probably people that I'm really excited about helping. And so maybe it's people who really love to cook but they don't like to do it for a job or something, they just really love it. And so I'll call them amateur gourmet chefs. Okay, that's good. Now you have customers, people that like you can identify with and hopefully know how to reach. 
so you can start talking to and figure out what problem they have. So I don't know what problem they have. Maybe they would really love to make fabulous food for their friends and family, right? Maybe. So you can go out and start talking to them and see if that's a problem or see if something else is a problem, but you're at least getting something specific that's going to be much more interesting to that group of people. Or another way to approach this is to start from the problem side. Maybe you're not quite sure who the customer is yet, but you know that there's a definite problem. So I don't know about you guys, but I feel like everyone I talk to, including myself, is like always trying to lose weight, right? So that's a problem. It has something to do with food, so maybe there's something with recipes there. So okay, start with that as the problem. Who's your customer? You could say dieters. But if everybody's trying to lose weight, then you're kind of back to anyone who cooks, right? So try to get a little more specific there. Um, maybe dieters in college, if you're a college student, you can kind of reach those people and you can identify with them. So the thing that you want to keep in mind while you're doing this is that you want to be building a painkiller, not a vitamin. I just kind of Google in my search on painkiller and that's what I got. <laughs> I guess it's from a game. I don't know. <laughs> um, and the only way that you're going to figure out where the pain point is is you need to get outside the building, right? So um, you guys know who Steve Blank is, the kind of father of customer development, of this notion that we need to develop our customers and make them to our products. Um, he says, no facts live inside the building, right? Only guesses. So we can be sitting there with our co founder and going, oh, I have this great idea. But we just have guesses about them, right? We need to get out and talk to people. So, um, my probably favorite MVP tool, if you can call it that, um, is a customer interview. It's just getting out and talking to people. And one thing that I really like for doing this, especially in the beginning when you're trying to understand the problem, is something called a problem interview. And so the idea here is that you come up with kind of a story, not a long story, like a 30 second, one minute story, about like a persona that has the problem. Um, so someone who's in your customer segment who has the problem you're thinking of. And then you go to people who are in that customer segment. So let's keep going down this dieters in college path. Um, so you go to dieters in college and talk to them, and you tell them a story. And it could be a personal story. It could be like about, oh, my sister has a history, or just you can make up a person. So you can say, like, I don't know, um, Kelly is an undergrad. And she gained a few pounds in the first few years of college, or the first year of college. And so, she's really upset by that. She really wants to lose some weight, and she knows what she should be doing. She knows she should be, like, eating under 1,400 calories a day. But she's dining halls all day, and she has no idea how to estimate calories. And so, she's trying to make the right choices, but it's not working, and it's really frustrating, right? So, if I say this to somebody who is in college and is dieting, then stories resonate with us, right? They connect. And so... I'm completely making this up, I know. Um, and so if I say that someone who's a dieter in college, and I say, does that resonate with you? There's a decent chance that person will say, yes, it does. Like, that's what I'm going through. Or maybe not. Maybe because I'm not a dieter in college, I have it wrong. But I'm probably in, like, the right area. So I can say, well, okay, if it doesn't resonate with you, does it remind you of anything? And they might say, well, I don't actually eat at dining hall, so that part doesn't make sense. But, you know, the first thing makes sense, whatever. So you can really start to understand what the problem is, right? So once you get that, you want to work with them and kind of understand what are the top three problems. You don't want to go, like, super deep, just high level. What are the top three problems that we're seeing here? And how do you prioritize them? Because that's going to help you when you start to build the product on making sure that you're addressing the top problems in the right order. And then the bulk of your customer interview with these people should be saying, okay, let's walk through those three problems and how do you address them today? This is really important. It's going to tell you two things. First, if they're not doing anything to address the problem today, it's not that big of a problem. It's not a pain point, right? If it was a real pain point, they'd be trying something. If they're not trying anything, what are the chances they're going to, like, take the chance on your, like, product that they've never heard of before? It's brand new. If they are doing something to try to solve the problem, that's really good information because now you know what you need to do better than. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> so, once you understand, oh, I should say one more thing about that. Um, I can do this. You know, there aren't like hard and fast numbers here on like how many people should I interview or how many people should say this, but you want to like always just be kind of looking for a signal, right? So, if you talk to five, probably even just five people who you think are in your target, five dieters in college, and you say, 
this story resonate? Does it remind you of anything? And they're all like, no. Then probably you've got something wrong and you need to go back to the drawing board, right? You don't need to keep asking people. Maybe your customer is wrong, or maybe just the way that you're facing your problem is wrong. Um, they say if you're doing like a consumer product, if you can talk to about 30 people and they all seem to be kind of head nodding on, yeah, that's the problem, you know, the story that resonates with me, um, and the top three problems are about the same, then you know that's a good signal, right? There's only a billion people, but that's a pretty good signal that you've got 30 people that, yeah, have a problem around this big enough that they're trying to solve it today. Yeah. So, Can you give me an example? Yeah, so that's a good so it's a good question. Here's the thing though. If I don't know that I have the problem, I'm not going to take the time to buy your product. Because I don't think that I have a problem. Does that make sense? And so especially with a startup product, people um, if anybody sees Michael Scott, he does these awesome startup secrets talks here, and he says you need to be ten times better as a startup than whatever they're doing today. Which is like a ridiculous ratio when you think about it, but it's because you know what? We're like used to whatever we're doing today, and it takes a lot of momentum to get us to change to anything. But then to get us to change to this product from a startup that just came up, you know, they could go away tomorrow. I've never even heard of them. None of my friends are using them. Like, why would I? Why would I use that product unless I had a really good pain point? Does that make sense? Um, okay. So once you kind of figured out, all right. I understand what the problem is, and it's really good to know that messaging too, because then when you do want to be marketing to them, you know like what words resonate with them, right? So the next step is okay. What's the solution that's going to resonate with them? And so here, um, there's something called concierge service, or sometimes when it's talking about technology, it's called Wizard of Oz for man behind the curtain, <laughs> as in it looks like there's technology here, but really it's just a person running around behind the scenes. Um, so a good example of this is Aardvark. If anyone's ever heard of Aardvark, they did social search. Um, and the idea with that is that sometimes there's things that you really need to ask a person. You don't want to ask a search engine, right? So um, I don't know, like, what's the coolest iLab mentor to talk to about customer acquisition, right? You probably just want to talk to somebody, and you want to talk to someone who's like an iLab resident that knows that. Um, so, okay, great, great idea. How would I build this? I don't know. I don't care. Let's see if anyone did this before I even worry about it. <laughs> so they put up this web page or something that was like this. When someone would ask a question, it would email the founder. The founder would go find an expert, so like in this case, find an iLab resident, ask them a question, get an answer, and email it back. When it got to the point where they were getting like a lot of people asking questions, they're like, oh, there's like a real business here. Um, then they decided they could build it. So as a, oh, as a developer, Oh, was it? Maybe. I think you're right. So, yeah, so Cora, the founders were doing something similar. So they would answer the questions themselves to kind of feed this. Um, so, yeah, you know, as a developer, this kind of thing scares me because I think, well, I think, okay, as soon as you get to the point where there's too many people to handle, then you have to, like, be able to switch it on tomorrow and you can't write the code in one day, right? But the truth was that Aardvark had actually took them a year to build it out. Um, I don't know all the details about it, but I'm just guessing they get started, like prioritize the most manually intensive parts first. Um, and they got acquired by Google for like $15 million. So it seems really ghetto, but it works. <laughs> um, I also like even going lower tech than that, something called concierge test. And this works if you're providing some kind of a service. So um, keep going back to that writers and college thing over and over again. Um, that's kind of a, you could say, okay, I have decided based on the problems that I've heard that the right answer, that people have a problem, they don't know what to eat at the dining hall to lose weight. So I'm going to provide a solution that tells them, gives them a meal plan of what they can eat from their dining hall food, right? So are people interested in paying for this? Before you actually take the time to build it, you could just, as a person, provide that service. So you know what? Um, I'm just going to pick on you. 
you're my customer, I'm going to go to the dining hall with you. You can tell me what you like, what you don't like, and I'll come up with a meal plan for you, right? If you're not willing to pay me to do that, when it would be highly customized and personalized, then probably you're not going to be willing to pay like an hour. This is not very personalized to do that, right? The other thing that I really love about this is if I'm actually sitting with you or sitting with whoever the customer is, then I can really understand how the process works. Like, what are the variables actually? What are, like, the gotchas that I didn't think about that happen while we're doing this? And what format does the customer like that meal plan or whatever it is I'm getting them in? And you can, like, really work with the customer on this and figure out something that, like, just makes sense and is elegant. And then when you build the product, it's so much easier because you know this is exactly what my first person should look like. Um, there's also other things you can do, kind of lumping them under concierge service. That might be stressing it a little bit. But um, you can do some tests just to validate. If you're like, this seems really risky. I'm not sure if customers would actually do this before I build the product. So um, Zappos is a good example. When they came out, they were like, we're not sure if anyone would actually buy shoes online. So before they actually built a whole company around this, what they did is they went to local shoe stores and they took pictures of their shoes. Um, and they put them up on a web page. And in exchange for they told the shoe store owners, if anyone buys them, I'll pay, it, pay you full price for them, right? I'm not making money. I'm just trying to test. Um, so they put pictures up and people bought shoes. So they moved forward. And that was just very successful today. So that was cool. Um, another example of this, you guys know, get around. There are the car rental service where anyone can rent out their own car. Um, so this is kind of a new idea. They're like, I'm not sure if anyone will be willing to give their keys to a stranger. Um, and so rather than building any tech at all, they just went to the small university campus. It was like 100 people. And they just, I don't know how to put a sign up seat. You can rent a car or you can rent out your car, right? And just saw which people would be willing to do it. And they were. So they went forward. I think now they actually got technology where you can, like, unlock the phone from your, or unlock the car from your phone so they don't need to get that keys anymore. But it was still the same concept. They're going to be comfortable enough, like, lending out your car to another person. So, um, a key thing to just remember as you go through all of this, um, and kind of, I guess, another gotcha that I sometimes see, is when you're demoing solutions or these um, tests with people, make sure it's your target audience. Don't do it like with your friends or with someone because they're like a startup advisor. Like, if they're not in your target, it doesn't matter. Like, you really want to be getting it in front of your target builder, target customers, before you build. Um, and then even when you're ready to build, there's still a lot that can be done without having to, like, go right out a bunch of custom code. Like, I'm a developer, but I still will find ways to, like, how can I do a mashup of, like, existing tools that are out there so I can code as little as possible so I can get something out there. So um, going back to Groupon, after they just, like, spent 20 months on the point and that didn't work, they're like, I'm not going to make the same mistake again on Groupon. So literally, when they put up, it was just a WordPress site. And it was kind of a ghetto WordPress site because, like, if they had something like a t-shirt as a daily deal, then it would be like, we get this in red and large. And if you need a different color or different size, you know, right? <laughs> they didn't have form functionality. But it worked. Um, and so, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but just be aware. And these are kind of like low-hanging fruit. I'm sure there's better tools that are more specific to whatever you're doing. But there's a lot of tools out there that you can use. You're not doing everything from scratch. Um, WordPress. You can actually do a lot in that. There's things like Google Forms and Wufu Forms. Um, you can actually embed them in WordPress now, so you could like ask for t-shirt sizes. Now, um, if Groupon was doing that today, there's website builders, there's app, mobile app builders, a lot of stuff out there, and there's just like a lot of other tools like I don't know, Folio if you are doing anything with phone numbers or Talkbox if you're doing anything with video. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, step number three. Just to keep iterating, right? Like, don't, don't feel like you need to get this right on your first try or your fifth try. Um, I don't want anyone to feel like their goal with doing their startup to be proving that they were right from the get-go because um, someone did this survey. I'm forgetting his name. I don't think of it. Um, he did a survey on the biggest, the biggest predictor of startup failure, and it was sticking to the initial business plan. That's 
pretty crazy, right? So we think like we want to like prove that we are right in the dark, we are like, right from the get-go. But the truth is, we're not going to be right. <laughs> we're going to be wrong. Like we want to stick to our initial vision of what we want to do, because we're passionate about that. But like all those little details, you know, we're going to have to try different things in order to get them right. So be okay with that. Be comfortable with that. And the fact that it takes a little while. Um, ultimately, you want to be going for this thing called problem solution fit, where you really understand the problem and who it's for, and get a solution that resonates with people. And finally, you want to launch when you're ready to. Okay, I'm ready to actually launch my real product. Um, Paul Graham says launch when you have a quantum of utility. Um, so, like this concept too, it is you should launch your first product to the world when you have something that's sufficiently better than what's already out there. And when at least some people would say, well, I'm glad that this came out, so now I can finally do X. Um, and he says you should prioritize for speed and excitement. I guess you should also prioritize for those three problems <laughs> that you found from people. But um, you want to do things that you can get out there fast, but that people are going to be excited about. And that kind of gets back a little bit to that, I get worried that people think MVP means put out a happy product. Like, oh, I can put out the login picture right away. Nobody wants to go use your app to log in or like do some like really tiny little thing. So whatever you put out there first, some people should be getting excited about. But it should still be something you can get out there quickly. And my last kind of word of wisdom is when you put it out there, don't be too minimal. Um, so my final example is this is kind of interesting. There was um, a startup called Easy Unsubscriber. I don't really want to put the name on the slide, but um, it was done by a guy here in Boston with Eric Reese, so we like, start up that. So I think that kind of makes it interesting. And the idea was there's this problem that we all get to like spam in our email boxes, right? And so they did an easy unsubscriber, so it be easy to unsubscribe from all of the stuff, right? That sounds really good. It's a clear problem that a lot of people have. It. But what they put out for to do the test for validation was so minimal, like. I get more functionality by clicking the spam button in my email. You know what I mean? So it only worked for like certain kinds of newsletters, and then it didn't do that much, and then it was like a bunch of steps. And I'm like, that isn't anything better than what I have today, and I'm not going to get excited about it. And so unfortunately, they decided to stop doing it because they decided that was validation when people didn't use it. So that was anti validation of their idea. Um, I did talk to Bob before. Like, I was going to give this example. I was like, is it okay if I share your example? Um, he's actually going to try putting out another version soon, so that'll be good. But, um, but yeah, just when you put something out there, don't put a copy product out there. Put out something that some, some people will get excited about. And that's all I got. There's just some um, list of sort of MVP tools that I went to. And uh, thank you all so much. Um, if you could all just do me one favor, if you walk out, there's polls there on the iPads. Um, it's really helpful for us to just get feedback on what people thought of the presentation um, so we can provide more stuff that you guys like. And I'll be around for a little bit getting questions. Thanks.